Hi, I'm Dr. Wendy Bohan, and I'm an earthquake geologist and senior science communication specialist for the Incorporated Research Institutions for Seismology, or IRIS. And today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about earthquakes and the kinds of questions that we ask when we're researching earthquakes. Particularly, I'm going to focus on the things that are interesting to me. Uh, and then I'm going to tell you a little bit about my career path into science because it was definitely non-traditional. So let's go ahead and get started. Some of the questions that we ask are things like, where are the faults on earth? Because faults produce earthquakes. So finding the faults helps us figure out where earthquakes are going to be. How often are there going to be earthquakes on those faults? And how big can those earthquakes be? When will the next earthquakes likely occur? And what effect will those earthquakes have on people and infrastructure? So let's get started thinking about these questions. First question is, where are the faults? We have lots of different ways to approach this particular question. To start off with, we have really, really cool instrumentation that we can use. Things like GPS sensors. You can see one of those over here in the right-hand picture. Most people have heard of GPS or global positioning systems. You may have them in your car or on your phone. We can use them for science, but the ones we have for science are very, very precise. They can tell how much the ground is moving and in which direction with incredible precision. If you look over here on the left, you can see an image from UNAVCO that's showing uh, the location of these sensors all over the Western US. So each one of these black dots is a, a GPS station and the red arrows are showing the direction that they're moving. Now the length of the arrow is showing you the speed at which they're moving. So you can see the ones down here in California are moving really fast and in a totally different direction than the ones here in Nevada. So that tells us something really interesting that's going on in the crust in the Western US. So what is it exactly that we're looking for here? If we have two GPS, position, uh, uh, GPS sensors and we know exactly what their position is, if they move through time, then we know that there is something in between them that's allowing them to move. And that something is usually a fault. In this case, these would be uh, GPS stations in the basin and range, which are places like uh, parts of Southern California, Nevada, Arizona. As these are pulling apart, you can see that there are faults in here. These would be normal faults or faults where one block is moving down in relation to another. So anytime we see two GPS receivers that are moving in different directions, we can infer that the place in between them is somewhere that we need to go and look for a fault. We can also use other cool technology like LIDAR, or light detection and ranging. So this is an optical remote sensing technology that we can mount in the belly of an airplane or a drone or a helicopter. And it uses a laser, not like laser beams on their heads with sharks or lasers that you can like cut things in half with. This is a non-harmful laser, but that laser measures the distance from the airplane where the instrument is mounted to the ground. So basically it sees how long it takes the laser to bounce off the ground or any object and come back. So let's watch the plane fly across. The laser scans back and forth. So perpendicular to the direction, the way that the airplane is flying. And we can figure out exactly how far away the ground surface is and map the ground in three dimensions using that. So how exactly do we use that to find faults? Here's an image from the USGS. This is the work of Carol Prentice and others. Uh, and this is showing us an area in the Southern, or I'm sorry, in Northern California and the San Andreas Fault goes through this region. So let's see what we're looking at in this image. See all these little knobbly areas? These are trees. So this is a forest. You can see this thing coming across here that looks kind of flat and wiggly. That's a road. This very strange square thing, that's a fence. That's probably a barn or something in there. You can see some other structures. So how do we find the fault if it's all covered up with trees and different things? Well, LIDAR allows you to do something called virtual deforestation, where we can get rid of the first returns that came back and assume that those are the trees. By getting rid of those first returns, that allows us to see what the ground underneath the trees looks like. And in this case, it allowed them to map out parts of the San Andreas Fault. But don't worry about the trees, we can virtually put them back in. And in the process, we can learn something really interesting about the trees themselves, including canopy height, above ground biomass, and those sorts of things that are really important for biologists, or so they tell me, I'm not one of those. So, okay, we have the LIDAR, we're scanning the surface of that, and we can find exactly where the fault is using the LIDAR and of course, mapping on the ground. Why do we care exactly where the fault is? Well, this is something I'm really interested in. We wanna know how past earthquakes on faults have disrupted the layers because that can tell us something about how big the earthquakes were and when they happened. 
But first, a little bit more about LIDAR. Why do we need LIDAR when we already have other maps? Well, over here, this is a USGS National Elevation Database, uh, database uh, Digital Elevation Map. So DEM is a digital elevation map. What is that? I mean, it could be clouds, it could be waves on the ocean, it could be my fingerprint up close on my phone because I forgot to uncover the lens, right? Could be just about anything. The resolution is not high enough. So using uh, LIDAR, we can get really good resolution. So this is showing exactly the same image. And this is what that image area looks like on the ground. Look at all that vegetation. Like, what are we even looking at? So it looks like there's a stream right here and we're all standing in here. Where's the fault? Well, the fault we know goes right through here. But this brings me first to a few of the other questions. So how often are there earthquakes on these faults that we have now found using LIDAR? And when will the next earthquakes on those faults likely occur? We can address when the next earthquakes will likely occur by looking into the past. The past is the key to the present. So here we are back on the San Andreas. We're standing right in here. This is the same image we were looking at before, only it's color coded by slope for how much the ground is tilted. And this area fits into the big picture of uh, the San Andreas in Central California because it's right in here. So this is in this is Wallace Creek up there. So Central California area. All of these little lines across here are paleoseismic trenches, or places where we dug down across the fault, which is running right through here, in order to see into the layers of the fault itself. So here's what those paleoseismic trenches look like from the air. And this is what they look like from the ground. So it really is a big, long hole in the dirt. And you may be thinking you are a crazy person for loving to sit in a big, long hole in the dirt and stare at the wall and like map it out. That may be true. And it can give you a lot of really interesting information. So after we have taken pictures of it, cleaned it up, and then you go into the lab and you can actually figure out exactly where the layers were. So sedimentary rocks like these, we assume are generally laid down horizontally and they're flat and continuous. And if they are no longer flat or no longer continuous, then something has happened. And in this case, the something that happened were earthquakes on the San Andreas. So if you look at this blue layer, for instance, this was at one time all one layer. Now it's broken up into these little pieces and parts. Same with the green layer, same with the yellow layer. So this is giving us evidence of past earthquakes. Now, if we can date each one of these different layers, we can get an idea of when these earthquakes occurred. So that's things like C14 dating that you may have heard of or carbon 14 dating along with other things. Now, this is one location and we can find out a whole history of past earthquakes in this one location. But imagine if we take the San Andreas Fault and we have lots of these paleoseismic trenches along the San Andreas Fault. That allows us to get a much more complete and thorough history because we wanna know not only when past earthquakes happen, which allow us to figure out about all, how often they occur or their recurrence interval, but we need to know uh, spatially where they happened because a fault doesn't always rupture or break for its entire length. Sometimes smaller parts of the fault will break. And if a little part of the fault breaks, then that's a pretty small earthquake. But if a, the whole fault breaks, that's a really big earthquake. So if we find evidence for earthquakes at the same time in different trenches, that gives us an idea of how big those past earthquakes were, which is important. Because the magnitude of the earthquake can often have a big impact on people and the structures that we build or our infrastructure. So what is an earthquake really? I mean, we have a general idea, right? But an earthquake occurs along a fault. A fault is a break in the rock that has moved in the past. And what happens is that you have stress that's building up along this fault due to the action of plate tectonics, broadly speaking. Eventually, the friction on the fault will be overcome by the stress and the rocks will break. When they break, they send energy waves out in all directions. Those energy waves are what we feel as shaking. That's what we think of as the earthquake. And so ground shaking is one of the hazards that people think of most often when we talk about earthquakes. So this is an example of an earthquake that happened in Nepal. And this is an image taken from a marketplace in central Kathmandu. Uh, we have inserted a GPS instrument that was located nearby and have mapped it out so that you can see how the GPS is moving at, along with the people that were moving at the same time. So they've been you know, correlated so you can see the same motion. 
So here comes the earthquake. Now you can see that the people are feeling the ground shaking. This is why we tell you when you feel earthquake shaking to drop down, take cover under a sturdy object and hold on. You can see there are people falling. Some of these people may be injured. It can be really difficult to maintain, you know, being upright during earthquake shaking because the shaking can be really, really intense. So of course, ground shaking is not the only hazard that we have from earthquakes. Um, and an interesting thing to, to think about is that ground shaking is not evenly distributed. So every earthquake has one magnitude, which is roughly speaking, the amount of energy that was released by the rocks breaking. But what people feel, the shaking intensity is gonna be different in different places. And that depends on the magnitude, how far away you are from the earthquake and the local rock and soil conditions, which you can see really well in this image here from the Ridgecrest earthquake that happened in California in 2019. This star is showing you the epicenter, which is the point on the surface of the earth directly above the hypocenter, which is where the earthquake starts deep inside the earth. And the areas of strongest shaking were mostly around uh, the epicenter. But look at this, got really strong shaking over here. And this yellow shaking is strong. And it's, you know, you've got areas of less shaking. Do you see a pattern with this and the landforms? The areas that are the valleys tend to shake more than the areas that are the mountains. And that's because the soft sand and soil that's located in those valleys shakes like a bowl full of jello. So you shake harder and for a longer period of time if you're on soft sand and soil than you do if you're on bedrock. Another earthquake hazard is surface rupture. So not every earthquake actually breaks the surface of the ground. In this case, it did, and it tore this poor little cottage apart. This is an image from the Kaikoura earthquake in New Zealand. Liquefaction can be another earthquake hazard. So in order for liquefaction to occur, you have to have loose sandy soil and a high water table. And what basically happens is the earthquake waves push the water up towards the surface, which pushes all those little grains of sand or dirt apart and causes them uh, to lose the ability to hold things up. It basically turns the ground into quicksand. So you can see an example of this here. No, you can't. Anyway, you can imagine an example of it here. And we have all of these gifts on our webpage at iris.edu. So, all right, another hazard that you can uh, potentially uh, have happen during earthquakes is landslides. So this is an image from the 1994 Northridge earthquake. This is from the Pacific Palisades. There were more than 9,000 landslides around the Los Angeles area during the Northridge earthquake. And what often happens is that you'll have a wildfire that goes through and burns the vegetation. The vegetation's roots help to maintain the stability of those slopes. Also, if you've had heavy rains recently, it can make the soil and those slopes really heavy. And so when the earthquake shaking comes through, it jolts them down and can cause landslides. And you can have all of these hazards in one place. And if you live in one place, you can have different hazards depending on exactly where you are. So this is an image from the California Geological Survey of Southern California. For those of you that are familiar with the area, this is Santa Monica down here, UCLA is right here. These areas of yellow that have the line in between, these are areas where there could be potential surface rupture. The areas in this greenish color here are areas where you could have liquefaction. So this is areas where you have loose sandy soil and a high water table. The blue up here are places where you could have landslides. So these are fairly steep slopes. And of course, this entire area has the hazard of shaking. So each one of these places have different hazards, but what about their risk? What exactly is the difference between a hazard and a risk? So a hazard is something that has the potential to harm you, like a shark. Risk is the likelihood of a hazard causing harm. So if you're on the beach, you have a, a low risk, even though there may be a hazardous shark in the water. And this brings me to another point. I'm gonna step up on my soapbox now. There's no such thing as a natural disaster. What you have is a natural hazard, like a hurricane or an earthquake or a flood that then overlaps with a vulnerable system. This creates the risk of a disaster. So what is a vulnerable system? Vulnerable systems can be vulnerable in like so many different ways. So you can have um, 
a vulnerable system because of infrastructure. If your houses and your bridges aren't built to withstand earthquake shaking, that makes your infrastructure vulnerable. If you have a population that's not familiar with that particular hazard and doesn't know what to do, that gives you risk of vulnerability. And in some cases, the population is not able to respond in a way that will keep them safe from the hazard. For instance, when you have an urban area that gets hit with a hurricane or an earthquake, people aren't able to leave the area because they rely on public transportation, for instance. That makes that a vulnerable system. The East Coast can be very vulnerable to earthquakes because Earthquakes aren't just for California or Alaska or Japan. We have earthquakes all across the United States. And as it turns out, earthquakes in the central US and on the East Coast are actually felt more broadly than earthquakes on the West Coast. So for instance, this is showing a comparison from the USGS of did you feel it reports. So after an earthquake, you can go online and fill out a report talking about what you felt during the earthquake. So these, all these little dots are people that felt different events. So over here, these are people that felt the magnitude six Napa Valley earthquake. In red, these are people that felt the magnitude 5.8 Pawnee, Oklahoma earthquake. In green, these are people that felt the 5.8 Central Virginia earthquake. And in blue, these are people that felt a magnitude 4.1 earthquake in Dover, uh, Delaware. So you can see that there were a greater distribution, more or less, of people um, maybe not a greater distribution. You had people down here in Southern California, but in any case, lots of people felt this earthquake in Delaware, even though it was a magnitude four. About the same number of people in California felt this earthquake that was a magnitude six. What's going on with that? Well, as it turns out, the ground in California is very broken up and it's kind of hot, right? You have all these faults, so the waves don't travel very well. On the East Coast and in the Midwest, you are in uh, the continental craton or the oldest part, oldest rocks in North America. These are old, cold, dense rocks. And so they transmit the waves really well. Also, the Appalachian Mountains have been shedding sediment for millions of years. So we have a nice cover of soft sand and soil that also transmits those waves really well. Additionally, we have very dense populations in these areas. And so there are more people to feel the shaking just in general. But Populations on the East Coast and in the Midwest aren't ready for earthquakes the same way that people in California and folks on the West Coast are. We don't have those hazards as much. So we have a lower hazard, but we have a higher risk when those events do happen. So what are some things you can do to prepare for earthquakes? Secure your space, make a plan, organize your disaster supplies. This should sound familiar, right? Hurricanes, snowstorms, floods, it's all very similar. Minimize financial hardship. This is the part that's different. If you feel earthquake shaking, drop down, take cover underneath a sturdy object and hold on tight. Afterwards, clean up any messes, help to improve your safety, and then connect with others in your community. Help where you can. All right, so that's the part about earthquakes. And now I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about what it's like to be a geologist and, and kind of how I got here. So being a geologist, you do a lot of field work. It's, or you can, you can also work in labs, you can work on computers, lots of different things. I have done a lot of field work. These are pictures of me, whoops. This is in India, Bolivia. This is in Argentina. I think that's probably in India near Pakistan. Lots of cool places that you can go. And you can do lots of work in the laboratory if that's your jam. I got to do both of those things. You can also make computer models. For me, I think it's really important to be able to communicate about our science. And so that's something I spend a lot of time doing. I train other scientists about how to communicate and best practices for communication. We also write lots of papers. So the unexpected benefits of science communication training, you write research papers and you write papers for the broader community. I do lots of community outreach, speaking to government uh, organizations, speaking at scientific conferences, speaking in classrooms, and also talking at things like nerd night, because right, science is for everybody. And I do lots of work on TV. I used to be a professional actor, so that was my strange career progression, right? Like I was an actor and now I'm a geologist, super weird, except that it's not. Everything that you ever do can be used later. Nothing is wasted, right? Any skills that you learn, any skills that you have are part of your toolbox and you can bring them into whatever career you find most fulfilling. So now I do things like um, kids shows. So the top is from me filming an episode of uh, Mission Unstoppable with Miranda Cosgrove on CBS. 
down here was after the Ridgecrest earthquake, where I was speaking on the national and international news, explaining to people what happened and what we can expect next. This was from a show, gosh, I don't even remember what it was on, but it was another kid's show. So trying to explain to people why science is important and why it matters can be very fulfilling. And, you know, I used to be a professional actor. So this is really the combination of the things that I really love and enjoy. And so take that as you like move forward into your career that you can combine things that may seem very disparate, right? You may love to draw and you may also love math, but those two things can be combined to make a career that is uniquely for you. So here's all of my information. If you need me, you can find me on drwendybohan.com. I'm also on all social media, more or less. I'm working on TikTok, y'all. Give me a break. I'm trying to get there. But anyway, you can find me on at Dr. Wendy Rocks. So thanks, everybody. I appreciate you. And I will talk to you later.